Okay, so hi everybody. Uh, welcome to um, Legal Cheek's Alternative Careers to the Bar session. I'm Alex Aldridge, uh, the publisher of Legal Cheek, and with me are five top lawyers who are enjoying very successful careers beyond the confines of the Inns of Court. Um, so we'll get straight into it. I'll introduce the panel. We'll get straight into it with the questions. I've got a bunch of questions here, but we're going to try and throw it open to you guys to ask as many questions as possible too. Um, okay, so first of all, we've got um, on the panel, we've got um, Angus Duncan, who is a litigator who has come up through the solicitor route. And since 2011, he's been a partner in the London office in the insurance team at international law firm Mayor Brown. Next to him is Tom Leach QC, who's a barrister who last year left top commercial chambers Maitland to join the advocacy unit at global law firm Herbert Smith Freehills. Next to him is Sarwan Singh, who is a barrister and pro bono director at City Law School. Having started out at the bar, Sarwan's career has included stints working in-house at law centres and local government. Next to him is Jeremy Consett, who originally qualified <coughs> as a barrister before working for a host of regional law firms as a paralegal, and through that he qualified as a solicitor and moved to a law firm in Reading and then in a kind of quirky, interesting route, has recently, last year, got a move to a big international firm, Kingwood Mallisons. And finally, next to him is Mark Soundy, who's the only transactional lawyer on the panel. Um, his, his career has been shaped by the rise of private equity, and he is a partner in the London office of New York law firm Sherman and Sterling. So, on Thursday, Legal Cheek's editor, Jonathan Ames, wrote a piece for the Times about how corporate law firms were in recovery mode because they, you know, upping their training contract numbers, um, increasing their pay for junior lawyers. But meanwhile, the bar, m many parts of the bar are struggling. And the parts of the bar that aren't struggling, i.e. the commercial bar, it hardly offers any pupillages. So if you look at the position, you know, you've got 5,000 training contracts a year and you've just got 400, slightly less than 400 pupillages a year. So we're going to start with you, Tom, just a question to, I mean, if you were starting today, so you start, obviously started out at Maitland, moved to a law firm, Herbert Smith Three Hills, but if you were starting out today, if you're one of these guys, um, would you do a training contract or a pupillage? Uh, well, I did a pupillage. When I was at, um, at university, when I left university, I think in my year there were 13 lawyers at my particular college, the university I went to. And 11 of those did training contracts at uh, city firms or other legal, other law firms. And only two uh, lawyers went to, went to the bar, and neither of those had set off at university to read law. So it's quite a late decision for me to do law at all, uh, and then uh, even later decision to go to the bar. Um, 20 years later, I suppose, I decided to reverse the decision and follow everybody else. A bit late, but perhaps... Uh, <laughs> maybe the right thing to do. I think that um, it depends on you rather than on, uh, that may sound to Alex like ducking the question, but it's, it depends very much on you. I don't regret for a minute going to the bar. I'm still a barrister. I don't think I would have uh, uh, moved across if I couldn't have remained a barrister under the 2007 Legal Services Act. So being a barrister is still hugely important to me, and I'm a venture of Lincoln's Inn, so I'll just get in my plug now for Lincoln's Inn, <laughs> where the food is obviously much better and the scholarships are equally good. But uh, uh, I, being a barrister was very important to me. So, um, and that's because I wanted to be an advocate. Uh, at Herbert Smith, we do run an advocacy program, uh, and the differences between the bar and junior practice at the bar and our advocacy unit are much, much smaller than they were when I started out in practice. If you were going into the city, city firm, you were going to do possibly transactional law, you might be going to do litigation, but you were sitting behind the bloke who was doing the talking. And I wanted to be the bloke who was doing the talking, not the bloke sitting behind him or the girl sitting behind him. So that's why I went, into, went to the bar, really. I wanted to do the talking. And now you can do the talking if you come to our unit. You do uh, some... Um, small advocacy work, and our aim in the unit is to, to generate as much possible small work for our starters, if you like, and our junior associates. 
they tend to do a little bit of practice in one of the big litigation groups first before they come to the unit, and that's the way they go through. So if you want to be on your feet immediately, don't necessarily come to us. You probably will see about the same amount of small work because we're, we have a very big pro bono um, a program. But that's enlightened self-interest because we want to see people on their feet uh, and we want to see people arguing cases. So the difference is not um, as marked as it was 25 years ago when I made the decision that many of you are now making. And I think it depends on a lot about you. It, are you. Do you feel independent? Do you really want to go this alone? Yes, the Inns of Court and the bar is a very collegiate place. You, you, do, you are surrounded by friends and people who want to help you. But the ties within a law firm are much uh, tighter in some ways. You work with the same people all the time. Oftentimes you build teams. You work as part of a team. If you see yourself um, flourishing, really, by taking those few steps through in part of a team before you go it alone. I would encourage you to think about uh, somewhere like us, some of the other firms that run advocacy programs. If you see yourself, I want to be doing this job immediately. I want to stand on my own two feet. And there is one of the great qualities about the bar, which mustn't be underplayed in any way, is the independence it gives you. Yes, there are problems, you know, which you've been highlighted and we'll talk a bit about later, I'm sure, about the criminal bar and the bar's approach to that. But if you, if the independence is what, and I was a very stroppy individual 25 years ago, I wanted to be independent, didn't want to be part of an institution, I wanted to go it alone. That's what I saw that the bar gave me. If you feel that way, if you, the independence, that part of the life is really what goes for you, then go for the bars. But I think the, sorry, I just finished and say that I, I think it depends on you, but the difference is not as great as they were when I started. Okay, let's get the contrasting view from the transactional lawyer on the panel. Mm. Um, do you get to do the talking? Do you, do you feel a lack of independence in a big corporate firm? So no, two, two questions. I, um, first of all, I mean, it's great to see so many of you here and on a Sunday. And for me personally, I'm sure I speak for every member of this panel, um, this is all about trying to help you find the right bit of the profession, your right slot. So if you have any questions at any stage, you know, after this or anything else, I'd be only too delighted to help. And uh, I have a lot of work experience students through our office. I'm sure other people do as well. This is all about getting the right thing for you. Uh, in terms of transactional lawyering and, and this thing about whether or not um, transactional firms and, and corporate firms are on recovery, I, from your point of view, sitting where you are today, I think you should follow your star and do what you think you are going to be best suited for because there are so many sacrifices you're going to have to make along any career in the legal profession that you might as well do what you really think you're going to love doing and that's what I do and you should take with a pinch of salt everything I say today because I've adored every second of the 30 years that I've done this so I'm a bit of a workaholic and, and I love the legal profession, I love this. Um, and I wouldn't worry too much about you know, where you think the future of the bar is going, where you think transactional lawyering is going. I would just do the thing that you think you're going to love and that you, and that you do best. For me, actually I always did want to be a barrister and my best mate became a barrister and I always sort of sat there thinking you know maybe I should have done this and it was the advocacy thing that I really liked the idea of and the fact that you know I was going to be master of my own destiny and if you ask him you know what what he likes most about the bar at the moment it is that he is master of his own destiny it is the fact that if he wants to take six weeks off over the summer he can do just that apparently uh, whereas I, I clearly can't um, but what I ended up doing was joining a law firm, and uh, I ended up uh, running a private equity practice. And a private equity didn't even exist at the time when I joined Travis Smith back in 1987. Um, and I suppose what I've done is gone with the flow. Uh, and I found myself, uh, you know, moving. First of all, I started in a traditional English firm. Then I uh, went to the dark side and joined a very different American firm. And now I'm in a US-based firm, but it's sort of somewhere in the middle between traditional English and, and very American and very aggressive. And I've, my career has just flowed with those firms. And I've never been too fixed about, oh, this is absolutely what I want to do. And I think you do need to be a little bit, little bit flexible. But where do I get my kicks? Short answer, I get them on deals. Uh, and on building things. And, and actually, it was interesting to hear Tom talk about it, because I think that's the biggest difference. You know, what I'm doing is trying to make my firm and my group a better place um, than it was when I joined it. 
you know, that is part mm -hmm. of what motivates me. Bringing is part of why I do graduate recruitment, part of why I spend so much time with our associates and things like that. I want my firm, I want my practice to be better. So it is all part of building. It's not just teamwork. It's actually genuinely wanting to build something. In advance of the event, all the, all the speakers on the panel wrote an article for Legal Cheek, sort of, okay. if I knew then what I know now, now style <laughs> article. And um, just going, dipping back into those articles, one of the most popular ones was Sarwan's piece. Um, and Sarwan, in, in your article you talked about how the importance of planning your career and kind of having a strategy at an early stage. Um, I mean, easier said than done. Um, um, yes, I think probably two of the biggest regrets uh, I would have looking back on my so-called career, uh, was probably the first thing is supporting Spurs when I was about 11 years old. <laughs> uh, that was a big mistake. And uh, if I knew now, um, I would probably go and chase some medals like supporting Chelsea or Man United. Um, but the other regret, if I was really, truly reflective, uh, looking back at myself and being honest, is I'm actually one of probably the, the most unambitious lawyer you're ever going to meet. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, and I did OK. You know, um, I, I kind of flitted between um, certain areas of law, certain organizations. Um, and I think looking back on it, it would have helped, perhaps, if I'd thought about, do I want to be in academia? Uh, do I want to be at the independent bar? Do I want to be at the employed bar? And really, throughout my career, um, I think that would have helped if I'd focused on that, perhaps. But having said that, I don't regret not having that strategy either. You know, think, you know life takes you to certain <laughs> places, and, and I, I've enjoyed everything. Um, and yet, you know, I wasn't that focused. I mean, you know, uh, I know most of you are undergrad, you're in your second year, third year, and so on. Um, you know, if I was talking to my son, who actually is a doctor, but if I was talking to my son, <laughs> um, uh, again, you know, I would be giving him the kind of talk of saying, you know, focus on what you want to do, try and yes. decide where you want to go, and, and so on. Uh, that's the kind of objective answer. Mm -hmm. But in a way, uh, you know, we all, it's interesting li listening to other lawyers. I think the, the most important, absolutely the most important thing is getting up in the morning and enjoying what you do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter where you are. Life is too short. It's a very intense profession. Um, you must enjoy what you are doing. And you know, my enjoyment was somewhere else. You know, my enjoyment <coughs> was working for vulnerable people. Uh, you know, the biggest kicks I ever got was taking on the state, you know, whether that was uh, local government, whether that was central government. You know, helping people who were not articulate, couldn't speak for themselves, didn't understand the legal system. You know, that's just what I enjoyed. And I've, I have absolutely loved every minute of it. So it's a kind of mixed message, really. Um, yes, objectively, that's why you're here. That's why you're giving up your Sunday, because you want to know what you should be doing. But I think what should underlie all of that is what is your passion? You know, what... What do you get off on? And we've already heard some of the panel talking about what excites them. You know, find that uh, and then follow that one through and focus on that, you know. Um, and then, you know, if you are passionate, <coughs> you are successful. I agree with that. You know, so. Just on the point of identifying your passion, because again, linking into your piece, Angus, because you know, you talked about how you, you weren't passionate for black letter law, but yet you're having this very successful career as a partner in a big law firm and insurance litigation team. Um, so, you know, you could have looked at that, I suppose, when you were at, at law school and you might have thought, I'm not into law, I should do something completely different. But actually, it turns out that you can be actually a very successful lawyer without having been massively enthusiastic for black letter law. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in terms of what I do, it's, it's a commercial practice, and so it is all about the commercial practicalities for me. Um, I think in terms of what I said in the article, I didn't enjoy studying black letter law actually practicing it is very different and um, I, the nuances of the academia involved in studying law was, was not something that interested me it did when it was philosophy but not for um, for the black letter bits because they are basically quite boring 
but actually when you're <laughs> practicing it, then the actual nuance, whether that word means what it really needs to mean, is what's important. And actually getting down to those nitty gritty details when you're in work and when it makes a difference and it's millions of pounds that somebody's gonna pay if that comma was really meant to be there, is actually, that does interest me and I enjoy winning cases for my clients. But that is very different to studying. So it's the difference between academia and, and practice, I think. And uh, Jeremy, um, you see, of all the panelists, you've had, had maybe the most unconventional route. Um, but you, you know, you started out, did the bar qualification, worked as a solicitor for a long time, and then have made your way up to become a, sort of a city law firm solicitor. I mean, really interesting route. Um, just your, your reflections on, on that for the audience. Well, I think I, I grew up in the, the 80s and 90s with a diet of the television characters Perry Mason and Kevin QC. And from watching that, um, that was it. That was my focus. I wanted to be a barrister. Nothing else would do. Um, I got through to study academia, did my law degree, and I entirely agree with Angus. I found the academia rather dull um, and thought this isn't what I want to do um, but when I got on to the the bar vocational courses it was then um, I found employment law and then I found my passion that was what I really wanted to do um, I paralegaled um, as Alex has said for four and a half years in the legal expenses insurance uh, industry and then went into private practice having cross qualified the reason for my cross qualification was because I wanted to do advocacy. That was, that was always my thing. Um, but I realized that in the world of employment law, you didn't need to be a barrister to do the advocacy. You had the speaking rights in the Employment Tribunal and in the Employment Appeal Tribunal. And it made more sense for me to cross-qualify, become a solicitor, have the security of salary and all the bits and bobs that go with it, the nice things like pension and um, healthcare benefits and all the rest of it. Um, but also it meant that I could handle a case from cradle to grave. I could do the litigation and I could do the advocacy and I had the full remit, I had the full control over the case and I haven't looked back since. Let's um, <coughs> excuse me, open this up to some questions from the audience. So first one there. So if you just ask me a question then I'm gonna repeat it just so we've got it for the <coughs> video of the event we're doing. So hello there, panel speakers. I'm Jackie Chai from Oxford Roots University. So uh, thank you very much for the uh, sharing. I enjoyed it very much. If I could ask Mr. Leach QC a specific question about what you've said. Certainly. Now, obviously, you've enjoyed um, t talking with very much, and I have um, enjoyed that very much as well, just by looking at them uh, in many pictures. Now, my question is this. Given that solicitors now have um, higher rights of audience, do you think that has actually made the distinction, the traditional distinction between a barrister and a solicitor less clear, and it means that the work that Barrister is currently doing might be fading away as some academics have um, commented in the near future. Look forward to you repeating that. So just repeating that. <laughs> 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 yeah. Read my mind. Um, but just to, to summarize it, so <laughs> the distinction between solicitor and Barrister blurring, particularly with the rise of solicitor applicants. Yes, I do think the um, uh, the distinction is blurring. I think it's blurring for two reasons. One is higher rights, three reasons maybe. Higher rights, the Legal Services Act, which allowed barristers and solicitors to combine together in business organisations. Those are the first two. And thirdly, and I think perhaps most importantly in my experience, is just modern methods of communication. Um, when I started in practice, you know, we, we were still the fax machine and the photocopier. Uh, opinions were typed up by um, secretaries or PAs and sent out. So you get instructions in and you would turn it around. The, qu the quickest you could turn anything around was three or four days. And you might not hear anything for, for weeks or months before the case came back to you. Now, uh, barristers are very heavily involved, um, as Jeremy says, from cradle to grave. And I've always enjoyed that. That's a been a big part of my, I suppose, MO as a barrister before I moved to Herbert Smith that I like to be involved from a very early stage of the case, and I still have that same MO. And I think just the involvement through um, modern methods of electronic communication, all the electronic devices you have, you, 
I think as part of a team, the, um, the relationship between the barrister and the solicitor, the speaking part, the non-speaking part, is, uh, is very blurred. And of course, other members of the team, massive cases, you can't do it all yourself if you're at the top. It's got to be a team effort, and sometimes the, the top will be three or four different speakers. And at the bottom, it's the same. You want to prepare your own cases, make sure that they are in apple pie order. And you can do that from start to finish at the bar in the same way you can in a solicitor's firm. I think it's slightly easier where I am now than it was at the bar. But I think that blurring of the distinction is a lot to do about with modern working practices. And I think the changes in the rules, higher rights and... Um, business organisations are a reflection of a change in working practice and a, a change in social attitude. So it may be that the, the blurring has come first and the changes in the law have followed. But I do think there is a very blurred, those, those two professions are merging or sort of blurring and there's a big Venn diagram where people do very much the same, same thing. I guess you're going to pick up. My experience is very different. I'm actually a solicitor advocate and I haven't done any advocacy since I was one year qualified. Um, I've, I've worked in three different city firms and uh, I know that Herbert Smith particularly does have a, a, a strong advocacy um, bent for its lawyers but in the firms I've worked in um, you would go to a barrister because barristers are expert advocates and day in day out they stand up and speak depending on the barrister obviously some people spend more time doing opinions but if, if the average barrister is somebody who does do court work and I despite being a litigator don't do court work day in, day out. I spend a lot of time advising people. And um, even though I'm constantly doing disputes, they're not ones that necessarily involve going to actually court. And therefore, I can't justify saying, right, I'm this many years qualified, I charge <coughs> this many hundred pounds an hour, um, and I'm going to charge you that for advocacy, even though I'm not nearly as good as somebody who does advocacy every day and has the same number of years of call and will charge you probably less than I will per hour. So my experience is that there is still uh, a very clear place for advocates, for specialist advocates, whether within a law firm or without. But one of the law firms I was at years and years and years ago now was Norton Rose. And they did at the time hire <coughs> a barrister into the firm. It was when the solicitor advocacy program had just started. And they hired a, an advocate in um, to be an in-house barrister. But because he also had his own practice as a lawyer, he ended up really running his cases and not being a barrister for, um, you know, available for as an expert advocate for other cases. So it's an interesting area, and it really has to be managed very carefully. And lots and lots of law firms clearly still don't haven't dealt with that. So it is still very separate, as far as I'm concerned. Just one. Just haven't we got a slight distinction here, though, between kind of the legal aid branch of the profession and the commercial branch of the profession? In that the legal, you know, my. My colleague was saying he, he predicts that the criminal bar and the criminal solicitor profession will be basically merged within the next five years and you have all the barristers working out of big kind of big chain legal aid firms which are obviously under pressure to consolidate because the way the government's structuring its legal aid payments but then you've kind of got the so, so there massive fusion but then at the commercial bar you've got you know, these hugely successful commercial chambers um, Albeit you've got some, so for example, Herbert Smith Freehills Advocacy Unit, very successful in itself, but it's, it's an exception to the rule in a sense. You know, it's the only one, there's, there's not another big advocacy unit that, actually there probably is, I shouldn't be careful saying that, probably is. But I'm very happy for you to keep it <laughs> <laughs> there's, not many, there's not many of them, and that's by far the best known one. Um, so, so do you think, so someone. I mean, I think there is a blurring of the professions, even when I was sitting where you are, um, that was a moot point. Um, I think through experience, and I've worked in both capacities, i.e. as an advocate and as an in-house lawyer, um, yeah, the distinction uh, is, is very small. It's becoming very small across the profession. Um, but I think, I, th I think for you, in terms of choosing a career, then if you want to go to the bar, I still feel that advocacy and the ability to get up in court and speak is an essential part of your DNA if you want to go to the bar. I still think that. Um, you know, that's not a scientific analysis, but I, I, think, uh, I think it's still there. Let's take another question. Um, sorry, I can't see it. <laughs> um, given that, I suppose everyone here hopes that will continue to be a market for specialist advocates, why do you think that there are fewer pupillages 
this year than there have been in the past, and do you think that that trend will continue? So why are pupillage numbers falling? Is that for me? Or um, <laughs> Jeremy, do you want to take that? Well, it's a slightly difficult question for me to answer because I haven't uh, worked at the bar um, for quite some time. I wonder if the effect of uh, the criminal bar um, has been a reason for that. If there's, the, if there's no money coming into the criminal bar, th then there's no way of um, providing pupillages. Um, I think... Yeah. I, was, I was interested because, you know, we'll move this back to Sarwan in a second, but just you're an example of someone who has, has not got, done a pupillage, no, no. but has had a very successful career. Um, so um, I suppose it would be a slightly different. I mean, the, the, how, how much would you put it this way? How much would you be concerned about the falling pupillage numbers for today's wannabe barristers? Well, when, when I was called to the bar, that was back in 2000, and I was called at this inn, so I suppose I ought to do a plug for this inn, the uh, free car parking on weekends is rather handy for central <laughs> London. Um, <coughs> yes, I, I mean, I, I was fully aware that it was difficult to get a pupillage. Um, I think in those days there were um, two and a half thousand people applying to do the BVC as it was, um, and then of them there were only half the number of pupillages. Um, and when you're applying for a pupillage, you're actually competing with people who are applying from the previous years. Um, so that was always uh, a big issue. And I confess, uh, you know, I, I came from uh, the provinces. Uh, I didn't really want to work in London. Um, I, it's, it's quite strange that I find I'm now in London. Um, but I, I didn't want that. that. That wasn't what I wanted by the time I finished the BBC. And I wanted a different way. So, so the notion that... Um, there were no pupillages available, or very, very few pupillages available in comparison to demand, wasn't so much of an issue for me because it was my escape route, um, if you see what I mean. I wanted to find another way into the profession and to do things in a different way, and that's what I did. And so I picked up the paralegaling route, and then later I cross-qualified, and uh, I haven't looked back since. But I don't regret doing the BVC, um, because of the advocacy training, because that's that's been the basis of my career, because I built a litigation practice out of it. So I'm just going back to you very quickly on the pupillage numbers point. Well, I, you know, the, re the reality, I think, of the legal profession as a whole is it does face attacks from all sides. And it probably, uh, I don't really know about the commercial side, but it's probably contracting. And there is certainly a side that has contracted, and I'm not an apologist for the governments who have taken legal aid away from people. Um, and it's not just crime. Uh, you know, people need to understand that. It's not just crime, it's family, employment, and many other areas. Um, so I think there is a contracting of the profession, even the solicitor side as well. You know, they have um, non-qualified conveyances and so on. So they both, you know, the profession does get... Uh, people try and um, uh, come in on the act, you know, and so I think it is a, it is a contracting uh, profession in that sense. I suspect pupillages are affected as well, you know, with the rule about funding, you know, that pupillage should be funded. So uh, probably, probably I think uh, it, it is perhaps getting uh, uh, smaller, you know, uh, and more concentrated. Could I just add a word, if I may? I'm wearing my other hat as a, I'm a member of the Education Committee of Lincoln's Inn, and it's quite clear, I think, wearing that other hat, that the bar is actually going through a transition at the moment, and bar the education of the bar is going through a transition, where the bar is, if you like, the four inns and the um, ATC, the Advocacy Training Council, are trying to work out what is the best model, because... Uh, on the one side, people don't want to see people gain a qualification which they can then never use. So it's too many people coming into the profession. And at the other side, they want to make sure that the competing objective, that the uh, bar is open to all. It's, it's, uh, diversity is uh, uh, obviously a major concern for us in the same way that it is for everybody else. But that's the way you have a strong and flourishing profession is by attracting people from from all backgrounds and and it's the com competition between those two objectives which 
it's trying to inform, particularly the Bar Standards Boards and, and its negotiations with the INS over education policy. So I wouldn't necessarily be dispirited by a fall in pupillage numbers. I'm sure the profession is contracting, but it'll increase and contract through market forces, government policy, all sorts of other things. Uh, but I think uh, ultimately when we work out and over this coming generation, I think the bar will be a stronger place for people to join because it will be very clear what your objectives, what you can achieve by studying the bar. So I would don't be dispirited, don't see the fall in pupillage numbers as a, a backward step making it more difficult. It is, I think, just a, a function of the way the profession is looking at itself and has been doing really since the over the last decade or so in an attempt to improve the uh, entry point the profession, make it easier for you, make it much more obvious and transparent about how you can achieve your objectives. So I, d I wouldn't treat that as a reason not to go to the bar. I would treat, you know, if we can persuade you to take another course because of what we've done, fine. But don't see that as a, 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 as a parachute or an escape route. The bar is still a very fine profession to join. Mark, I'm interested to just get your take on this as a former wannabe barrister coming at this from the city end of the legal profession, which is flourishing at the moment. Well, well I think, um, um, and I, I want to be very positive about this as well, but I think if you look at, so, so you've got a number of, of people here from uh, the, the upper end of uh, international uh, firms, whether it's Kingwood or, or Herbie's or, or Mayor Brown or my own, Sherman and Sterling, and what we're chasing, all of us, is that high margin work at the end of the day. Uh, so you're trying to, to stay among or get to being among the international elite firms who, and I think people have changed their view of the legal profession here in the UK. People don't talk so much about magic circle. In fact, you go and look at Freshfields now, they do not define themselves as a magic circle firm anymore. They want to be part of the international elite. And so there's something changing in the UK top end firms. And if you look at their trainee numbers, most of the magic circle firms are shrinking. Most of the silver circle firms are shrinking their training numbers. So I always say to people who are looking for training contracts, look at the American firms, look at the US-based firms, because they are the firms who are increasing or even establishing for the first time training programs in London. And part of the reason for that, here's the depressing bit, part of the reason for that is that the UK market is definitely you know, contracting or is mature. So when we're winning UK work as a firm, we're not winning it because the cake is growing bigger, we're winning it because we're doing a better job than the magic circle or the silver, for whatever reason it is, okay? That's the depressing bit. But the good news, the really good news is, if you look at it in an international context, now it's very different, difficult here, you know, we're in, we're in very lovely buildings here, we haven't got that diverse a panel, I'm afraid, but looking at you lot, you are clearly very diverse, and if you're anything like, you know, my older son and the young people we've got in our firm at the moment, you are far more international, uh, aspirationally, uh, and educationally as well, actually. Now, if you look at what's going on internationally, if you look in my, in my profession, uh, for the need for English-speaking, English-qualified lawyers, then the next 20, 30 years are going to be amazing for you lot. If, if that's what you want to do, if you want to go and join an international law firm on the transactional side, even on the litigation side, the international opportunities are huge. You know, we are transacting private equity deals uh, in the Middle East, in Latin America, in Africa, in India, and guess what? Guess what the governing law is? Because you know everybody sees you know English law, the English legal system, the English courts as you know the high water mark, uh, and you know that is the quality assurance test. And in fact, my great mate who went off and had this great career in the, at the bar, who I'm I'm now very jealous of. You know, when I talked to him yesterday about you know where he'd been this year, it was fascinating to hear that. Uh, you know, he's actually uh, travelled to the Bay Area, he's travelled to the Middle East, he's travelled to Bermuda, he's travelled to Cayman. He's, he's a restructuring and insolvency lawyer, but he's chasing, he's chasing that work internationally. And guess what? He can do it because as an English-speaking, English-qualified barrister, there is a real demand for his services internationally. And I think, so, a bit of negative stuff around the UK market, but incredibly positive, in my view, of the international outlook for the legal profession. Another question. Um, private equity, that's oh a very different area of commercial law to any other, and it's more personal and more intense because you're dealing with clients face to face. Um, and I just wanted to know what skills you need for that, and can you tell us more about the kind of work? <coughs> 
What skills do you need as a private equity lawyer? Well, actually, you know what? I mean, although I mean, although these things are all, you know, all, all, and I was just talking before we came that it is incredible to me how diverse a profession the law is. And it's incredible when I look at the people who I studied at law at university with or who I went to law school with, we've all ended up, most of us ended up as lawyers, doing incredibly different things, even if we were just on the solicitor side of it. You know, my mate at Allen and Overy is doing something totally unrecognisable from, you know, what I'm doing at Sherman and Sterling. However, uh, in terms of what we do as lawyers, actually, basically, it's the same thing because we're both trying to sell our services uh, and we're trying to charge for that by the hour. Unfortunately, we don't make, in the legal profession, we don't make iPhones anymore. So all we're really doing is selling our services, and we have to charge by the hour. And the way in which you do that, uh, you know, you, you could pretend to be better uh, than the next person, but that's actually extremely unlikely. There are a million and one brilliant lawyers out there. You could pretend to be cheaper, but most, most clients actually don't necessarily want what's cheaper. You know, if you've got a bad tooth, you don't necessarily want to go to the third best dentist because he's the cheapest one. You actually want somebody who's going to sort you out. So what we're trying to do is to make you buy my services. And the way I do that is by building a relationship of trust and confidence. And at the end of the day, I have to have that relationship with you. And I have to hope that you want to give me work more than you want to give Jeremy the work. You know, and, and it's as simple as that. And frankly, it's, it's the same wherever you go. That's, that's really what we're doing. So private equity, it may look cool, it may have great jargon around it, although I think it's brought a lot of country and a lot of businesses to its knees over the last five or six years. Um, but, but fundamentally, I'm not doing anything differently as a, as a lawyer, I suspect, to, to a lot of the other transactional lawyers. What about as a litigator, Angus? Is that client down, dynamic the same? Uh, well, because I do insurance, it is the same, because my clients are clients who constantly have litigation, and that's what they do, they do claims, so they constantly need a litigator, I think. For some litigators, it's not the same. I think the only comment I was going to make is, I'm not sure how true the relationship situation is for barristers. I know some barristers develop very good relationships with particular solicitors who send them lots of work. Mm. But I quite frequently hire barristers by purely looking up which one is the top one in this particular area mm. and hiring them. Uh, I do ask you know, colleagues what they think. But for barristers, because what I'm looking at is a specific expert in a specific area, it's actually, in some ways, slightly different to solicitors where what you need is a very good commercial relationship, a relationship of trust with your clients. So it's, it's an interesting perhaps mm. difference between mm. the two types of profession. Mm. That's one of the mixed messages I often see surrounding the barristers profession in that in one sense they're looking for kind of these flamboyant advocates um, <laughs> um, who perhaps aren't that interested in detail but on the other hand they want these kind of almost legal nerds with these kind of super brains. Um, Tom, how do you <laughs> <laughs> As a legal which nerd, one which, yeah. which one? I think I'm more nerd than super brain. Uh, I, I think one of the great benefits for me of the move that I made 16 months ago was the uh, possibility, two things I think, um, which reflect some of the comments that have been made. Uh, uh, after a I took silk, as, as often is the case, you end up, when I was at the bar, becoming very, very specialised in a particular field. Uh, and I, I did a kind of work very similar to the kind of work that Angus did. A lot of insurance work, lot, same insurance clients, uh, same area, special, s sort of speciality. Uh, one of the great benefits from moving for me was a wide variety of work. And uh, um, uh, again, the international element is, is very important. We do a huge amount of international, uh, uh, international work, and it's right that a lot of the large law firms are trying to position themselves internationally as part of a global elite rather than just necessarily an elite in the... And that is reflected in the kind of work that uh, litigators do, a lot of international arbitration, mm -hmm. a lot of cross-border work. Uh, I, I've been to, this year, over the last 12 months, Hong Kong. I did February, I did a, an arbitration in Israel, which I'd never been to before. Uh, of all places, and then I did two, the first cases in the Dubai International Financial Court, which has been set up about three or four years ago. So that's the kind of litigation that you can encounter at the, um, uh, th that I, I didn't necessarily do at the bar. Uh, so certainly the international, there is an international element which you find uh, in, the, in the city, which um, perhaps you wouldn't necessarily get access to through the independent bar. The other thing I'd say about apart from the diversity of work, is the uh, opportunity to build relationships both with teams within the firm, people that I work with now constantly, much, much more regularly than I did at the bar, and also uh, build those 
relationships and trust and confidence with the clients. The clients see you much more. They see you as part of the, the team that originally gets the work. So whilst Angus is, my experience is probably, at the bar is probably as it's described by Angus, which is that people would ring me up because I wrote the textbook and say, do you want to do a case about X? Um, not necessarily because of my uh, cuddly, uh, you know, warm and cuddly skills of getting to know the client. Now, uh, one's relationship skills, the soft skills, uh, are, are as equally important, uh, and those are skills which I've been having to acquire, I think, and probably didn't have uh, quite as much notice of when I was at the bar. So I think in a firm, solicitor's firm, it is true, you do build relationships, both internally and externally, which you don't uh, necessarily see at the bar. And that's why I said in, in answer to the first question, a lot of this depends on you, because those relationships are something, I think, that you may miss if you... Um, if you choose to, to go to the bar. But that may be for you. You may be, for some people, uh, that independence is a great thing. It is independence. Mm. For other people, it's solitary. It's a solitariness and a loneliness, which, uh, and that just depends on very much on your own makeup. Um, well, <coughs> really to endorse some of what has been said, I think whether you're uh, intending to go to the bar or become a solicitor or in some other way, um, there is something you've got to take as read, and there's really no doubt about that. Essentially, you have got to be intellectually strong. Uh, you need to, to show uh, that, you know, your academic CV is generally quite good. Um, but the thing about that is the profession would really take that as read. Everybody, uh, wherever they're working... Um, will expect you to be very good at that. So the question for you is you've got to get over that. that that's the minimum. But what is going to distinguish you uh, from others? And it probably won't be your intellectual acumen because there's so many of you out there. Yeah. And you're great. You're fantastic in that area. So what will make the difference? And I think it, you know, without using jargon, but I think it is your emotional intelligence. It is about the softer skills. And whether you're in a law firm, whether you're in a set of chambers, whether you work for a large uh, organisation, that can make a difference. And it can make a difference also in terms of your promotional aspects uh, when you're working for somebody. So I think, because you don't get that in, in your training. I mean, I, I've trained on the BPTC now for 15 years. We don't teach that side of things. We just teach the... The skills, the written skills, the, the oral skills, um, and the technical skills. What we don't teach is how to get on with people, how to understand people. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that is something, if you can, do, if you can think about that and develop that, um, people will recognise that in you. Just on the academics point, because actually, you know, somebody who covers the legal profession, actually there's quite a surprising number of lawyers out there with not great academics, real hot shots actually. Like for example, Mark Lewis, the phone hacking lawyer, got a two two from, I don't even know which uni it was, but it was not a good uni. And, um, and, and, and it's, Maybe it's getting a rip. He's, <laughs> he's got different skills and you do get these rough diamonds who actually, if they can just get in at the initial stage, can have very successful careers, working in slightly unconventional ways, slightly odd character, some of them, but to see quite a few of them at the top, if they can get through in that early stage. Jeremy, your route was unconventional. You got into a city law firm now, and you, you, you've got a taste of that. Yeah. But my question is, has it for these lot, is it possible? Can they get in with lower grades, worm their way in, and then flourish once they're in there? Well... I mean, you, you describe these lawyers as being odd characters, so I... Well, There's nothing wrong. I'll, I'll, I'll take that on the cheek. Um, uh, yes, I'm... I, I, Mavericks I, would be better. I, I like the word Maverick. Um, yeah, no, I, I'll hold my hands up. I was one of those that didn't get uh, the degree that I wanted. I came through with a 2-2. Um, at the time of doing my final exams, I was seriously ill with uh, glandular fever and was hospitalised um, as a result. So... I, I couldn't put in the best possible performance that I would have liked to have at that time um, because I was so ill. Um, notwithstanding that, 
I just push forward. Uh, and perhaps that's part of the reason why I didn't really go through the, the, the pupillage application system, because at that time I wasn't well enough. I was told by my medical team I needed to take time out, um, and I just secured a place on the BVC, and you don't turn that down um, if, if you're in that position. So I went through with it anyway, but um, by the time it came to pupillage application, I, I, I just wasn't interested. Um, I think I think really the answer is you just have to have sheer guts and determination if you are going to be one of those lawyers who's come from not the best uh, footing uh, in order to push forward your career and you've just got to work hard at it um, and yeah the, I think the point was made earlier um, that you've got to have that outstanding academic record it was nice for me to eventually have an interview uh, with Kingwood Mallisons where my academic CV was not taken into consideration at all for the first time because of my career and the cases that I'd handled and the work that I'd done was so good as far as they were concerned that my academics didn't actually matter anymore because I just worked doggedly at employment law and making the best of it and creating those client relationships and I uh, you know th the point was made earlier that w when you're on the bar vocational course you don't um, y you're not taught how to create those client relationships and I actually learned how to do that from working in retail um, as a student because that that was the only way I you know I could learn about client care mm -hmm. lawyers are notoriously awful at client care <laughs> Um, and if they could just manage <coughs> client care, we'd be in a much better position. And I learned how to manage client care. I learned how to uh, work with my clients and build up that relationship. And that's what's helped me push through. Take another question. We have one back there. Yeah. Um, how does the panel envisage the vocational stage of the training of BPCC evolving over the next five to ten years, uh, especially in light of the ribbon? So how does the panel envisage legal, legal education, vocational legal education, changing post Ridland report? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a turbulent environment, and your, your, that question has been raised at a time when it is all being up, it's all up for grabs. Um, but all of the uh, organisations involved, including uh, those who train, uh, barristers in the future are looking into this and um, it appears and I, I really can't say because nobody knows yet but it looks like it's going to be pretty dramatic the change um, <coughs> and they're trying to deal with this issue of supply and demand um, as well as trying to um, uh, allow anybody to to qualify uh, and there's that tension of, uh, between those two things. So we, r we are right in the middle of change. Um, what, I mean, it's not going to happen tomorrow, no, no matter what, what they say and no matter what their timelines are. They're, they're pretty unrealistic, some of them. But, you know, it may be in five years, I think, you may see a completely different training and education of, of barristers. If it happens on that side of the, uh, the profession, uh, you know, the solicitors may follow route. Um, the sister side is changing. You know, look at the SRA uh, approach to things, deregulation, hands off, and so on. So, uh, unfortunately, I can't give you that answer because I think nobody really knows. They're looking at it right now. Will it stay uh, in the format that it is at the moment, uh, which is the BPTC? I mean, I, I'm, I have a vested interest in the BPTC. You know, I've, I've taught it for many years, and, I'm, and I've worked for one of the providers. Um, I think it will be a shame, I really think it will be a shame, and, and I'm saying this not from a vested interest, if the BPTC becomes diluted in some form, because it's a great course in terms of the skills you need at the bar. Uh, and I hope, that, I hope the, the people who have the power and the influence don't lose sight of that, that they make sure, because the medical profession, the accountancy profession, uh, other professions have a very high bar of, of quality when it comes to their training. And I just hope, you know, because of this supply and demand issue, 
uh, that is maintained. But I, I, I don't know what the panel thinks, but it, it's really up in the air right now as you ask the but question. My understanding is they might actually merge BPTC and LPC. But, I mean, that, that's even more uh, a radical idea. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's honestly, they're all look, and, you know, like they, they make these band statements about, you know, nothing's in and nothing's out. Um, but I think they are, it, it, it is a, I think it will be quite revolutionary what they eventually come up with. Can, can I just add one word, if I may, which in answer to your question, which is, I mean, I don't know, and uh, I'm sitting on a committee which is uh, supposed to be considering this, but the, uh, uh, I think the one thing that you can be certain of, um, particularly with the, in light of the audience today, is that the, certainly the four ends of court, uh, in my own in particular, I'm sure the same is true of inner, are all dedicated to achieving what is best for potential entrance to the um, profession. I think we all see it as our duty to try and achieve the best possible education system. We, the various providers, the regulators, and of course the practicing barristers may disagree about what that is, but there are no vested interests trying to stop you from coming to the bar or to contract the profession or to make it more difficult for you. In fact, the reverse is true. What people want to achieve is a system which is fair and open and offers the best to to, to students and, and, and people entering the profession. So there is a dedication, I think, that you can be sure of, that people are trying to achieve the best possible system for you. Time for one more question. Keep them short and we might be able to think two, but yeah, go, go for it. Um, this question is for Sam Um You talked about getting your kicks out of helping people. Um, during your career, what do you think has been like your biggest um, moment of fulfillment and satisfaction from helping people? And what kind of, sorry, what kind of sacrifices have you had to make to do that? Okay, I'm going to shorten that talk so we can fit, fit them in. So just a quick answer. A few quick fire, we'll do three quick fire Q&As now. So that's the first one. Most fulfilling moment in a sentence. I suppose it's helping it has been helping individuals who honestly have no chance in life. And whether the outcome is another 20 pounds or thousands of pounds, I think it's just fantastic when, you, you know, when you've learned this skill and you're using it for somebody else. Um, you know, that's a pretty big kick. Next one. <laughs> okay. Okay, so it's a good question. So just to repeat it, is, you know, highlighting the lack of diversity on the panel. Is it no women panel members? Already, there's been a comment on legal cheek saying, "Where are the women on the panel? This is my fault." I try. We've always tried and get some women on the panel at all our previous events. We have done. So it's a fantastic panel. You've got to say it's a panel of great speakers. But the, but the reality is, there's there's many fewer um, women lawyers in the higher echelons of law firms and at the bar. Look at the statistics. Look at the legal cheek most list statistics. You can read them there and it's, I mean, you're lucky to have over 20% and that, that is a reality. And so does anyone on the all male panel want to take this? <laughs> yeah, I'll, 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 I'll stop very quick. I mean, diversity, and I'm not just talking about gender diversity, is absolutely key. And actually, I think one of the great things that the US-based law firms have done is they've raised the bar on diversity as far as the city is concerned, and indeed pro bono as well. Um, which isn't to say that anybody has cracked it. Uh, that clearly they haven't. And of course, the imperative here is, is not altruism. The, the imperative, this is entirely client-driven. Uh, you know, the, the, the clients that we have internationally are incredibly diverse uh, and they expect their, their lawyers to be just as diverse as well. So they're not interested in stats, they want to actually see for their own, through their own eyes that actually you really are genuinely diverse. We have over 50%, um, as you know, coming out of law school, over 50% are women, uh, over 50% coming into my firm are women. Um, and then it just tails off in four or five years' time, suddenly, bang, you know, where are all the women? They've all gone. We work incredibly hard with all sorts of different policies, uh, with all sorts of different um, affinity groups, outreach programs, etc., etc., to try and change that. Uh, it, it isn't changing at the moment. I think women are beginning to be smarter. I think the lean in idea is, is fantastic, and I think women are, are beginning to get smarter about how they are navigating, you know, around all the problems and, and getting through glass ceilings as well. 
it, it's going to take another generation to really sort it, sort it out. If I was here with, with a number of my female partners, they'd be furious when I say this. I think we need quotas as well in some of these areas in order to really kickstart some of this stuff. Um, so uh, an awful lot of time and effort is going into it because there's a business imperative there and there's an economic imperative. We're losing, it costs us £300,000 to bring every trainee through to qualification. So if we do 15 trainees a year, that's four and a half million pounds we're investing as a graduate recruitment team over time. We do not want to lose that investment you know, within 18 months. It's absolutely crazy. So huge amount of time and effort going into it. Uh, the results are getting better, but we're certainly nowhere near where we should be at the moment. Okay, can I just, just pick up as well? Um, I'm on the uh, diversity team at uh, Kingwood Madison's. Um, and... We, we are trying to create a new culture of diversity within the firm, and it's an interesting time, especially given that um, uh, we're an international law firm um, headquartered in China, which is not always uh, well known for its uh, diversity record. Um, so these are um, exciting times ahead. But one of the things that you will find if you are working for a, a big global law firm is that your clients will expect you and as part of their pitches will require you to report back to them on your diversity record. And if you don't have a good diversity record, then you will not be instructed. Okay, guys, I'm, a f I'm really sorry, we're gonna have to wrap up. We're over, it's seven minutes over, but I'm sure you can catch one of the panel members in the lunch afterwards to ask the question. Um, so, just, I'm sorry we've had to rush, but we're at the end of our hour, it's flown by. You know, thank you to a brilliant panel, it's been fantastic.